we're going to begin a new series today that's called Generations, and I think it's going to be a series that is going to be eye-opening, and I think it'll be a little bit fun for us to go through as well. Maybe you've noticed this once or twice since you've been coming to church, but if you look around, have you noticed that we're different? you notice that there's people that are old and some people that are young? Have you noticed that you all, don't all dress the same? And have you noticed that you probably listen to different music when you get into your car and put the radio stations or CDs or whatever you listen to? We're very different. And yet God calls us to be together as a church of all generations and to worship Him. And in the course of not only my ministry years, but in the course of just growing up, I've noticed that sometimes there's even conflict within churches between the generations. And, and we kind of can do a little bit of this once in a while, because we all want to be important. And then what's been unfortunate in the church, I speak of big church now over the years, is sometimes when one generation isn't getting along with the other generation, they just go somewhere else. And so consequently, we even have in our country more and more niche churches. Churches that are for 20-year-olds, churches that are for 30-year-olds, churches that are for 70-year-olds. Maybe never designed for 70-year-olds, but that's what happens when all the younger people leave. And so one of my prayers always since I've been in ministry, that we would always be a church of all generations. And a church of all generations that thrives together. Not survive, but thrives together. Because we love each other, and we appreciate each other, and we want to bless each other. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, way back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 22. And uh, let's stand as we hold God's Word in high regard, and we read these words this morning from Deuteronomy 10. And now, Israel... What does the Lord God ask of you, except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all His ways, to love Him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? Keep the Lord's commands and statutes I am giving you today for your own good. The heavens, and, the heavens, indeed the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord and had His heart on your fathers and loved them. He chose their descendants after them. He chose you out of all the peoples as it is today. Therefore, circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the resident alien, giving him food and clothing. You are also to love the resident alien, since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. You are to fear the Lord your God and worship Him. Remain faithful to Him and take oaths in His name. He is your praise, and He is your God, who, is, who has done for you these great and awe-inspiring works. Your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 people in all, and now the Lord your God has made you numerous like the stars of the sky. People of God, this is the Word of God. You may be seated. What a wonderful promise to end on, as we even talked about it in the baptism a few moments ago. Abraham gets this promise that. You're going to be the father of all these nations. Your, your descendants are going to be so numerous. Look at the stars in the sky. And then it seems like it's kind of plodding along a little bit. Seventy people go down uh, to Egypt, and now there are so, so many. And now look at today. Here we are sitting here today, walking in the same promises of the Lord. So the foundation for this entire series, before we talk about any particular group, is what does the Lord require of us? You can see, what the Lord requires of us crosses all the generations. And so God is talking to His people at this time in Deuteronomy. They haven't always done things in the right manner. There were a lot of ups and downs. And the Lord was once again letting them know, 
this is what is required of you. And so, the things that he's asking of us this morning are a variety of things right out of this passage. And we need to continue to tell these things. I look around and I see people that are in their 90s. I see little kids there. And we keep saying in generation after generation, that's how Israel did it with people. We have books, we have the internet, all sorts of things, music to remind us, so many things to remind us. But don't stop telling it. You know why we have to keep on telling it? Because we leak. We leak. We forget. We drift. And so it's important to keep reiterating and reiterating and reiterating the story. As these kids up here were doing this timeline, it kind of boggles your mind that they're remembering the words, they're remembering the tune, they're remembering the actions. I have a sense that beyond their personal brilliance, that one of the ways in which they've been able to grasp this long timeline is they keep doing it over and over and over and over again. And that's what God calls us to do in all the generations. There are things that we all must remember and do. And it's literally at a time that the Lord says, if you choose this route, here's blessings. If you choose the other route, there's going to be curses. And it's important for us to remember that all these things that God's talking about today, these are for the people that He's redeemed. Okay? These are the people that He's calling right now, His children like us, gathered here at this church. These are not for people who are outside of the faith at this time, but for those that have been redeemed. Characteristics that describe the redeemed of the Lord. In other words, after you put your trust in the Lord, you might ask, are there obligations? And the answer is emphatically, yes. Yes, that's why we ask questions like we ask this morning when people become partners in mission. Are there obligations? Yes. In following Christ, yes. Yes, and we do those joyfully. And we ask the questions of the church. Yes, there's obligations. And so we're going to talk about what the Lord requires of him. See, some, some like to say, well, Pastor, isn't it enough just to love him? I mean, can't I just, just love Jesus? Isn't that enough? I just love Jesus. Do we have to get involved in all these details? Can't I just love him? Well, let me ask you this question. How related to my wife? What if I said I love my wife? But I never came home at night. I entertained other women. I didn't provide for her. What would you say? Well, Pastor Bob, you may say you love her, but you do nothing to support that love. I think you are speaking about love just in mere words. Exactly. Exactly. And so, as Christ followers, we just don't say, we love Him, and that's it. There are things that we're called to do. What does the Scripture say this morning? It says to fear Him. How does the text say we do that? By walking in His ways. What we do is we acknowledge that God is in charge. We are not. He made us. He called us out of darkness. He redeemed us. He is awesome. He is majestic. He is holy. We need Him to be the sovereign God over all. Therefore, we fear Him and we do what He asks. It's not a fear that looks like being afraid, but we fear Him kind of like a child fearing their parents. Okay? Because they're the, the authority. They're the ones who are in charge. And we follow Him. That was connected with fearing Him. God has given us Jesus to follow now. We follow in His steps. You want to know what to do? Look at the life of Jesus. Literally ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? How would Jesus react to a situation like this? It really is as easy as that. So when we think about, do we condemn this person? No, Jesus said, I am not coming to the world to condemn the world, but to redeem the world. That should dictate our actions. And then we also love Him. We've talked many times in this church about 
about having the capacity to love in our lives increase. So you might be a 6-ounce glass, become an 8-ounce, a 12-ounce. We hope to grow in our capacity to love that looks like a big barrel. But we're to continue to grow in our capacity to love the Lord, and in so doing, what we will have is a greater capacity to love others. We love Him with everything we have. Our hearts begin to overflow with that love for others. You can see that all the things that we talk about here, fear and following him and loving him, they're all intertwined. Because in my worship, I love him. In the fearing of him, I love him. You know, it's interesting because some generations, they express their love differently than others. And all I can say is, let's continue to grow in our capacity to love and let's never hide behind the generation we're in as to whether we're going to love expressively or not. The passage also says to worship Him. So we can talk about Sundays first when we come to worship Him. When we come in here, it's really all about Him. It's not so much about us. When we sing, may our affections be lit up inside, and may they be aroused to lift our voices to the Lord in praise. May our bodies express worship as we express our love to Him. May our knowledge of God continue to grow deep. See, when we have a little God in our minds, a little God in our minds, we tend to have little worship. But when we have a big God, our worship will expand. And so our worship is in direct relation. How well do we get to know God? How deep do we go? And the deeper we go with the Lord, it's amazing how that will show up in such greater worship for us as individuals and as a church. The Bible here in Deuteronomy says that we're to be obedient to Him. To him. We do what He says. You know, that really defines a life of worship, not just on Sundays, but through all the week. We're obedient. We do what He says. Why? Is it out of compulsion? It's out of the love that we have for Him. The Lord gives rules not because He's having a bad day and just wants to throw the rules at us. The Lord loves us. He commands us to do things because they're the best for us. And then in verse 16, it's going to be on the screen here. Look at this verse. It's a little bit different. Therefore, circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. Interesting. Circumcise your hearts. Well, it's interesting because in, in kind of the vernacular of the Hebrew as compared to the New Testament Greek and now, heart literally there means more like mind today. So try to think of mind and what it means there. And so circumcision, what is it? It's pulling away of a foreskin. I'm not trying to be gross, but they circumcised their male children to show that they belong to the Lord. Now the Lord is using the word circumcision with their hearts. And so what he's asking them to do is to, to pull away or cut away any protective covering that prevents God from entering into your mind. Pull that away. Open up. Circumcise those minds so that you can receive everything that I have for you. And when you think of circumcising your mind, think of your wills, think of your thoughts, think of your mental processes. Why do we do that? So we won't be stiff-necked. We won't be stubborn people who want to have our own way and go kicking and screaming, but we'll be filled with love. We saw this this morning in baptism. When we talk about baptism, it's an outward sign, the water, of an inward reality that's taking place inside of a baby, a young boy by the name of Chip this morning. And the same thing when we talk about the circumcision of our minds. What we have is sort of this outward thing going on with our minds that reflects an inward reality of what God's doing inside of us through the Holy Spirit. Remember what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. 
be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. So here we are, a church of all nations, a generation. <laughs> I love it because sometimes in the summer you'll see a man in a suit and the kids in shorts. Some like electric guitars, some like organs. Some make quilts during the week and some like to go out and paint houses. Fact is, God desires us all to be one in mission. So what do we hope to do over these next few weeks? I hope that we get to understand each other better. It's really important. And I hope that that understanding moves to appreciation. See, we kind of have a narcissistic thing about ourselves that comes with sin, and we just want everyone to be like me, right? If only they be like me. And whoever you are, that's the me. I wish they'd sing songs like me. I wish they'd dress like me. I wish they'd like the food that I eat. All these things. That's what happens to us. That's our sinful bent. But the Lord calls us to love each other and to appreciate each other and to understand each other. And we want to, as a result of understanding and appreciating each other, to be able to live into our mission better. So the first generation we're going to talk about briefly this morning is the builder generation. Now, if you can, if you were born before, in 1943, or before that, will you stand? What is it, two, three, four of you? Okay, you're the builders. Let's give thanks for the builders. I was going to show a video this morning, but because of time, I'm not going to. I'll probably have a video most other weeks. The video I was going to show you, which to me kind of epitomized who the builder generation is, and it's literally shifts in men after men after men after men hitting the shores of Normandy on D-Day. And that just shows so much about this generation. Because that was a battle where many, many people were lost, but knew that if they could hit the beach of Normandy and, and find their way into France and beat the Germans there, that truly would be the beginning of the end, of which was true. So there's a lot of things I wanted you to know about the builders this morning, and I'm going to ask this every week. The builders, hopefully, when you hear these things, you're going to go, uh-huh, that's us, uh-huh, that's us. But then the other generations, I want you to really listen. And builders, I want you to tell your story to others as well. So the builders are often divided into three groups. There's the GI generation. They're often seen as being born before 1925. The silent generation, 1926 to 1939. Huh, my dad was born in 1924, believe me, he was silent. Um, war babies. <laughs> uh, war babies. War babies. 1940 to 1945. So for all of us in the room, our formative years are generally, our most formative years are seen as ages 13 to 22. In other words, what happens in that block of time does a lot to shape us towards the future. The builders had a variety, a, a very different world than that of today. There was a slower pace. Families always ate around the table, many times more than once a day. I remember a guy in the church I served in Minnesota, his name was Mike. And Mike would talk about, he lived just south of Rochester, and he says, you know, when uh, he went to school in the morning, they always carried, and I don't know anything about firearms, so I'll say it's wrong, but he carried some sort of a, a long gun that looked like a rifle. He said, Pastor, it was a good day if on the way home. I shot a squirrel. And then naive me would say, what'd you do with it? <laughs> we ate it for dinner. My mother was so happy if we'd walk in with a squirrel. But see, there's a mentality there that in this generation, we just, I mean, number one, a kid walking with a shotgun on his way home from school, that would not go over well. Okay? There's a lot of laws against that. But that was the day. Coming home with a squirrel was a bonus. That's going to be something that we're going to eat that night. Mom always cooked in the home. If anything was broke, it got fixed. These were people who were born post-World War I. Post-World War I, it was a traumatic 
national experience. 20 million people perished, including over 100,000 American soldiers. How does that affect the psyche of a generation? In the 20s, when we entered the 1920s, it became a, a, a decade where people just wanted to forget. So they became known as the Roaring Twenties. But the Roaring Twenties came to a huge halt on a Tuesday, which became known as Black Tuesday in 1929 when the stock market crashed. There were formative events during this entire generation. That stock market crashing was a huge one. And it led to the Great Depression. Now, many have heard of the Great Depression, but it's getting farther and farther away, and so we're not appreciating as much as maybe we used to. I heard a lot about it growing up. Between 1929 and 1932, worldwide gross domestic product fell by an estimated 15%. You say, Pastor, I'm not an economist. Make a claim. Well, just to make a claim, during what we call the Great Recession, 2008 to 2009, the gross domestic product went down under 1%. You see? 15%, 1%. This was devastating. During the height of the Great Depression, there were 15 million people that were unemployed. There were a lot of people engaged in a rural lifestyle at that time, doing farming, and with things like the dust bowl going on, it became survival as the goal. Other formative things, the automobile came during this time. The automobile in that it became something that families would get. And oftentimes families from this generation can tell you the story when they got their first car. People listened to the radio. Why did they listen to the radio? Because there was no TV. And so from FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's fireside chats to listening to drama hours on the radio were things that families did. They'd sit on the, on, the, on the rug on the floor in the living room and listen. Things that kids nowadays can't even fathom, right? And then there was the New Deal. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected in 1932 after Herbert Hoover, what was Hoover saying? That there would be a chicken in every pot? Something like that. And it didn't work out that way, did it? And then consequently, there were these little towns called Hooverville that didn't work out. Well, FDR comes into office, a new deal, and uh, which was all about relief. A wide range of programs went into place, and we learned new letters like F-E-I-C, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. SEC, Securities Exchange, those are directly related to the stock market and to the banks. The CCC, of which was the job order, what is it? Thank you. Um, there were so many programs with acronyms. We are across it. We came up with those things. Then what kind of music did Graham and Grandpa listen to? Big bands. People like the Dorsey Brothers, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, Glenn Miller, George Gershwin, Benny Goodman. So when guys later came on the scene like Elvis Presley and the Beatles, you can understand why they threw blood clots in their brains over that, right? Let alone what's happening today. But certainly the most, the most um, defining moment probably of this generation was December 7th, 1941. As a matter of fact, those of you who are in other generations, if you ask builders, where were you when that happened? I'm sure that they'll be able to tell you where they were and to describe that day, because that was the day that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. It was a defining moment. And people came together in remarkable ways to win this war. Freedom was at stake. There was threats to that freedom in Europe as well as in the Pacific. Men who were very young, late in their teens, all the way to 44, were eligible for the draft. Many volunteered. Women entered the workforce in record numbers. Those at home prayed and bought war bonds. What was the toll of that war? Between 60 and 80 million people perished. 
20 million soldiers died, 400,000 American soldiers. And this is a statistic that is very significant because in the wars of the age between 1960 and now, even though there have been wars, and all war is a tragedy, numbers pale in comparison to this war. And these were people who had just come out of World War I. There were names that became household names at that time, names like Eisenhower, Patton, MacArthur, Marshall. People learned of these places in the world, Iwo Jima, Normandy, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Within the war, people did rationing. They literally had to ration certain foodstuffs. Do you remember rationing, Gladys and Wilbur? They're not their heads yet. They, yes, they do. Things like tires, because rubber was scarce, and things like gasoline. My own parents, who got married in 1945, had to have a group of people save gas rationing coupons so that they could go from Chicago to Miami. It wasn't a matter whether you could afford gas, it's whether you had the stamps to do it. And then family, school, and church were the three primary influences on the young people growing up in that day. To become a responsible adult, you were supervised by family, church, and school. These three institutions were so very important. And then, of course, the builders experienced the Korean War as well, of which came literally on the heels of World War II. And now this whole other issue that was being dealt with called communism. We just sit back and I just went through those one after another after another, these formative events. Think about these events and the impact that they had on an entire generation. It is no wonder that this generation has been described as the greatest generation. And dear people, we need to sit up and listen to this generation. We need to hear their stories before it's too late. Because while there was pain and there was suffering and there was other hardships, there is richness that comes through these dear people. And this richness can be described in a variety of characteristics like hard working. I mean, it goes without saying that farmers work hard and, and the rural foundations were still in place at this time. You know, and people who worked in the factories or in the cities, they didn't have labor unions, the labor practices that we have today. The days weren't always eight hours. The weeks weren't always 40 hours. There weren't nice little lunchrooms to eat in and whatnot. It wasn't always nice. People in this generation, they were used to working so much. This generation typically says when they retire, I'm busier than I was when I worked. Because one of the things that comes so easy to them is they work. They were savers and frugal. After all, they had rationing. They learned how to save. They learned how to make something out of nothing. I remember my parents, you know, you didn't throw away a peanut butter jar until it had been sprayed with the spatula. Because there was at least a quarter of a teaspoon left in there. They were savers. They had seen the stock market crash and the banks collapse. They would save rather than spend. They saved a lot as they focused on the well-being of their own children. They were frugal. Not too many luxuries. In Christmas stockings, I remember being over at the cottages at Christmas and just asking that question of some of our senior saints. And they said, at Christmas time, we would often, when we got our stockings, and we think of little toys that we might put in our kids' stockings or money or gift certificates or whatever, they received apples or nuts or oranges. Clothes were mended. You don't know what that word looks uh, it means? Go and Google that later. Mended. Cardboard was put in shoes to make them last longer. Amen? Yeah. And lights went out when they weren't being used. Heat was turned way down. Air conditioning? What's that? They walked. They used public transportation. A common phrase that they used is, we can make do without. 
credit purchases rarely. And folks, this generation is extremely patriotic. Many had fought in at least one war. All were affected. The days like Veterans Day, Independence Day, Memorial Day were very, very important. There was a loyalty to the nation. There was a loyalty to leadership and the country's ideals. What was seen in winning World War II and coming out of the Depression, there was great loyalty to this great country. The builders are high in defending their religion. They're committed to buying American. Oftentimes, work for one company their entire career, many times in the same position. They oftentimes will see things as black and white, not a thousand shades of gray. And also, the builder generation, they were very private. We don't air our dirty, our, our dirty laundry out in the public. It's good to know about people, but don't share your deep concerns. And this even went as far as oftentimes between husbands and wives. Few physical expressions of love shown to others. Many sons never received a hug from their father or other closeness. These are very respectful people. These are people that demanded of their kids that they refer to adults by Mr. and Mrs. and always uh, their elders by such uh, name tags. Some would say that the generation that's alive today that's coming up is the me generation. Well, the builders could be described as the we generation. They support each other in dramatic ways. Very dependable. If the job is worth doing, it's worth doing right. Okay. See, you know it. These people are stable. You see that in a rural lifestyle, okay? And what's done? You rise, you do your chores, you cultivate it, you plant it, you water, you harvest it. I mean, that cycle goes on. My dad got up in the morning, he showered, he went to work, he came home, did a couple things, got up, and again, it's very dependable. I was taught the value. You miss school if you have a fever of about 105 or I'm throwing up. I had a lot of perfect dependence because I couldn't meet those standards. And there's a little intolerance that exists. And I don't want to be negative here, but, but what happened is, is in this generation, when you go to the cities in which I grew up in, people lived in homogeneous communities. The German people in Chicago lived here, the Italians lived here, the Dutch lived here. So there was their way of doing things, and there was a certain intolerance that existed there. Okay? Because of the homogeneous units they lived in. And, and intolerance that, always, that often existed because, hey, our parents do it the best. This is the way we do it. And so that carried out a little bit. And so now when we think of builders of the church, Oftentimes, in the first part of the 20th century, when churches were built, where were they built? They were built in the center of town. And you see that in a lot of the towns that you go around. Look at First Reformed Church, almost the center of town. Okay? Because that reflects the importance of the church to this generation. Sometimes builders attended church because of spiritual commitment. Sometimes builders attended church because of social commitment. Bottom line is, a lot of builders attend church. Builders are often found now in smaller churches today. They often promoted programs in the past. We want to evangelize. Let's have a week of revival. Let's organize a trip to that Billy Graham crusade. They came back from the war and they, they said, there are a lot of people out there that need to hear the words of Jesus Christ. And so we want to have a great foreign missions program. They're high on committees and boards an organization. It reflects that stability. Knowledge of the Bible was always very important. You know, if you know enough of the Bible, you're going to do the right thing. This is something that comes out of this generation. A lot of emphasis on context. However, there was not a lot of time spent on personal belief systems. And we'll see that come up later when we talk about other generations and how we look at the Bible. Again, not one way wrong and one way right, just different. 
sometimes see builders see a need to defend their way of doing church. Remember stability. They have modest facilities, often resisted things like air conditioning. Thank you for not resisting it. They love old songs. They like the order of worship to be the same. Very loyal to denominational structures. Oftentimes they had difficult times, difficulty changing churches. And when they moved to another area, they would often stay in the same denomination. When it comes to corporate worship, they like quietness, minimal audience participation, content sermons, pastoral and congregational prayers, organ and piano. And I just want to stop and celebrate the builders that are in our church. And this is what I've observed in the three years that I've been here. How well you bless others. How you love our children and the grandchildren of this place and the young people. How you have been open to change and to give up some of that maybe stability to see what God would do within that. And how you have taught everyone so many things. You know, as we look back to those things in the book of Deuteronomy, I thank the builders. So many builders in here have set wonderful examples for what it does mean to fear the Lord, what it does mean to worship the Lord, what it does mean to obey the Lord and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It may be different, done differently than the generations of today, but you have set forth a course that I am very grateful for and we are very grateful for. So thank you for the way that you've walked and you've led. And when I look at this generation, the generation so dear to me because my parents both came out of this generation. I, of course, didn't appreciate this as a teenager and probably didn't come to appreciate it for a few more decades the way I do today. But if there's one word that I would use to describe this generation, it would be sacrifice. Sacrifice. And I believe at the core of the sacrifices that you have made, that you have made for your country, for your church, for your children, that that sacrifice is rooted in the sacrifices that the Lord made sacrifice that took him to the cross so that our sins could be paid for. Our sins could be atoned for. And that he came out of the tomb so that we could have new life in him. John 15, 13 says this, No one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. To celebrate the building. Next week, we'll move on to another generation. And you know, folks, if you keep celebrating and keep loving and encouraging, I believe there's nothing to stop what God would do to a church that is humble to Him and loving the people around them. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for every person that's in our midst this morning. And what a what a fun day it has been to celebrate the children with classical conversation, uh, to celebrate the Brahart family and the baptism of Chip. To be able to look around this room and to see some dear senior saints, senior saints that are in their nineties, and they're still here, they're still professing Jesus Christ as the Lord of their lives and setting an example. I pray, Lord, that our senior saints would never feel left out or isolated or marginalized or on the sidelines. Because, Lord, I speak for myself and I think the generation that I live in, we need them. We need the wisdom that comes through uh, our seniors. So thank you for how you poured your grace through them uh, onto this entire church in its story of unfolding grace. We love you. We give ourselves to you in Christ's name. Amen.